Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Esparza. It's an honor to uh, be here and have the opportunity uh, to address you and to thank you for your longstanding service uh, to global health uh, through your work on HIV AIDS and of course other other illnesses, especially uh, for the America. So it's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, uh, I don't know how we're doing the slides. Uh, should, uh, do I have the control or do you have the control? I guess I do. I, I don't know. Maybe somebody can let me know. Uh, do it. Do I just ask you to change the slides? I guess we'll just uh, move forward. Uh, uh, can we have the next slide, please? So we've seen a very uh, dramatic uh, decline uh, in the number of kids who have died from vaccine preventable diseases uh, over the years. Uh, and you can see this uh, reduction in deaths uh, from uh, measles, tetanus, haemophilus influenza type B and diphtheria, and a lot of this work of course, was uh, led by the Gavi Alliance, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, of which PAHO has had such an instrumental uh, uh, role. And uh, much of this was launched initially with $750 million from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and uh, to me, it's been one of the most important contributions to uh, global health. On the right, I just uh, love showing these black and white images. I first saw them at a uh, this, uh, an exhibit at the Pan American Health Organization at PAHO from the Brazilian uh, photographer Sebastio Salgado, and it's a very moving set of images. Of he spent time going around the world uh, taking photographs of kids getting their vaccines, and I love it because of the uh, expressions of the parents' faces. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide after that. I'm um, sorry, keep going, guys, because I think this was a, a an extended presentation that uh, keep going. And st stop there. So I think one of the big uh, effects that we've seen now is that we have, uh, despite all of those gains, we have seen a, a significant reversal uh, in, in some of them. And it's happening for an interesting reason. And this is the subject of my new book uh, that's forthcoming. And it essentially says if you look at the uh, uh, progress that we've made, we have seen a somewhat of a slowing of our progress in vaccinating the world's children. Uh, in that uh, we, uh, uh, in the hot spot areas of the world and such as in parts of sub-Saharan Africa or in Central Asia, we're seeing uh, either a slowing, a halting, or even a reversal of those gains. And there's increasing evidence uh, that it's a huge collection of social determinants that's causing this. So even before COVID-19, my premise is we've seen some declines in, in global health uh, because of war, or political collapse. Uh, in some cases, climate change is having a big factor, uh, urbanization, and a shifting nature of uh, poverty uh, that I sometimes call blue marble health. And I know we're going to hear later from Professor Heidi Larson, who's done important work in this concept of vaccine confidence, and that is also a major factor due to a growing uh, anti-science movement. Uh, but on top of that, we're also seeing these uh, social determinants where political collapse, climate, and also climate change uh, contributing to the rise. And together with a group at Texas A&M, we've identified now a uh, list of hotspot areas where we're seeing this and trying to derive what's called a vaccine risk index, which incorporates uh, Professor Larson's vaccine confidence project, but adds on to it all of the factors uh, such as war and urbanization. And, and and it looks like it's going to be pretty predictive of trying to understand where we're going to see declines in vaccine preventable diseases. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And 
The other big force that we're seeing is a shifting nature of poverty uh, that also seems to be predictive of disease. And I call this blue marble health because it it's distinguishes it from traditional norms of, of global health where historically we've talked about developed versus developing countries. What we've really seen is a, uh, uh, a shift in that and that when we talk about global health, we always think about some of the poorest uh, countries in the world, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia. But when we actually add up where most of the world's poverty-related diseases are, uh, they're actually in the group of 20 nations, the G20 economies, the world's largest economies. Now you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can we talk about poverty-related diseases in the G20 economies? Well, what we're seeing is the poor living among the wealthy accounting for a large percentage of these diseases. So uh, so when you ac actually look at the see the world where the world's cases of leishmaniasis and leprosy and dengue and tuberculosis, they're overwhelmingly in the G20 nations, but it's the poor living among the wealthy. And I have blue marble health to distinguish it from traditional norms of global health. So what I'm showing you on on, on the left and the right is to make this statement that COVID-19 seems to be going by this a similar playbook. If you look at where the world's 30 million plus cases are and 1 million deaths, overwhelmingly they're in the G20 economies, but especially the poor, um, and uh, in the US and Brazil and India, et cetera. And I've just done a, a update of the Blue Marble Health concept as it pertains to COVID-19 and it's called Poverty and the Impact of COVID-19 It's and it's free. You can download it on Johns Hopkins Project Muse uh, uh, with the logo on the left there. And if on the next slide, please. So what I wanna show you is an example of this here in the United States and and what we're seeing in, and you can just go to the next slide as well. I stop there for a minute. What you see is, this is a reg, uh, stop there please. Um, what you see is a, uh, uh, if you look at the list of daily uh, deaths from COVID-19 in Houston, this is a typical day of, of the death report uh, from COVID-19. And it's very devastating because, it, as you see, it does not provide the name, but it provides the uh, age and uh, sex and then race or ethnicity. And we see this almost every day now. It says Hispanic, 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 you know, black, black, Hispanic, Hispanic. It's basically, uh, my, my point is, I think what we're seeing in across the southern states in the U.S. is this historic decimation of Hispanic communities. Uh, certainly in the metro areas of Texas, such as Houston or San Antonio or Dallas, uh, but also in, uh, uh, in uh, many of the, uh, in Florida and Georgia and going into Arizona. And uh, I testified recently to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus because it's a point that's not being well publicized in the United States. So it's not only Latin America, but the Hispanic communities really being decimated. And, and the troubling part is you see many of these individuals are not, you know, not, they're not octogenarians. They're in their 50s, 60s, many in their 40s. So it's robbing a generation of, of uh, parents from these families. And this is uh, very much the blue marble health concept. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And the question is, okay, what do we do about this? Well, clearly a number of us are committed to uh, working on vaccines. And one of the points that I like to make is uh, developing COVID-19 vaccines is not as complicated as you might think. In some ways, it's an old school problem in virology. But that uh, Dr. Esparza would have done when he was training at Baylor College of Medicine. It's about inducing strong virus neutralizing antibodies against the spike protein and also T cell immune responses. And the point is there are multiple ways uh, to do this. This is a slide from uh, Dr. Fauci who he presented over the summer about the different types of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, either uh, DNA and RNA vaccines, what's called genetic immunization, adenovirus vector vaccines, uh, live attenuated vaccines, nanoparticle vaccines, 
and recombinant uh, protein vaccines like our, ours at Baylor, but the point is they're all more or less trying to achieve the same end goal, and the idea is trying to create as many shots on goal as possible for that purpose. Uh, next slide. So to go into a little more detail, on the right, um, many of the vaccine candidates are adenovirus-based vaccine candidates, and uh, those would, would include uh, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine and the J&J &J vaccine, but also the Russian vaccine is an adenovirus vectored vaccine, as is one of the Chinese vaccines. And then the, if you shift one over from the right to the middle, where it says replicating virus vaccines, Merck and companies exploring two live virus uh, vaccines, replicating viruses such as vesicular stomatitis virus, the same technology used for the Ebola vaccine for COVID-19, uh, as well as uh, measles construct. And then if you go to the left, no, keep going, stay, stay there, please. Uh, and then if you go to an activated virus, uh, you see uh, that it's, uh, or what's used there is uh, the Chinese are using through Sinovac and an activated virus vaccine, as are in India at Bharat, and then uh, you have weakened viruses, and that's also been one of the strategies. On the next slide. And then we have, of course, DNA vaccines, where that's electro-incorporated, and the DNA goes into the nucleus to express RNA, and then protein, and then one step is cut short through an RNA vaccine. So the DNA vaccines are made by Inovio, RNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer. And then on the right, you see uh, protein-based vaccines uh, such as ours, uh, but also Sanofi is preparing a recombinant protein vaccine. And on the bottom, also comprised of protein or virus-like particles in Novavax. But again, they're all focused on inducing immunity to the spike protein. Next slide, please. Next slide. And so what do we want these vaccines to do? Well, the major features are, um, obviously we want to reduce severity of illness and prevent people from getting sick and going to the hospital. Uh, that is the, really the minimum criteria because you also want them to prevent infection. And you might say, well, aren't those two the same? Well, no, they're not because for instance, in an influenza vaccine, where there's where in a year where there's not a good match between the vaccine and the virus, you might reduce severity of illness but not prevent infection. But ideally, you'd have a vaccine that does both, such as measles. Uh, and then number three, not only prevent infection, but if enough people get um, vaccinated, then you can even interrupt transmission, which uh, would be uh, yet another goal. And it's not really clear with all of these vaccines moving forward, uh, what, what kinds of vaccines we'll wind up with, whether they'll meet uh, criteria number one only without preventing infection or whether they'll do that and whether we'll get widespread coverage to stop transmission. On the next slide. So uh, in the US, our program is known as Operation Warp Speed and it's a public-private partnership between the pharma companies and the uh, United States government. And um, I'm showing you the vaccines that are uh, part of Operation Warp Speed or the US program, which includes three vaccines that are now moving into, that are in pretty advanced phase three clinical trials, two mRNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer, as well as an AstraZeneca vaccine from uh, Oxford. And then we're looking at a uh, second wave of, of vaccines to follow, protein particle vaccines, adenovirus vaccines from Novavax and J&J. &J. So we have two adenovirus vaccines, two mRNA vaccines, a recombinant protein insect cell vaccine, and then the um, li a live one from Merck and Company. So we'll see an array of vaccines. And the warp speed part is not so much shortchanging the clinical trials, but rather ensuring that we um, do the manufacturing now, whether or not we know the vaccines actually work, and that's called manufacturing at risk, and that's the major piece that's causing the acceleration. On the next slide. So there are lots of advantages, but some potential disadvantages for Operation Warp Speed. Uh, the advantages include uh, an accelerated timetable, a diverse array of new technologies,
Uh, lots of innovation, so you're getting multiple uh, shots on goal, meaning an array of different technologies to apply to the problem and manufacturing a risk to accelerate things with the goal of protecting the American people. Now, there are some disadvantages listed on the right, and they include the fact that um, many of the new first wave of Operation Warp Speed vaccines use new technologies never licensed before. So, um, we're often wonder whether we've gone a little too overboard on the innovation sometimes and maybe we should have think thought about balancing it with some of the old school vaccines like an activated virus vaccines or fermentation recombinant protein. Also some of the vaccines potentially are expensive. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine also requires frozen storage which means minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit which will make it complicated uh, for access. My two biggest criticisms of Operation Warp Speed, and I am very enthusiastic about Operation Warp Speed, especially the science and the innovation, but my, the two, my two biggest concerns are on the, on the bottom right there. One, there's really not been a communication plan for Operation Warp Speed. It's been putting the companies in the lead. And, uh, and I think the message coming out from some of the companies such as Moderna and AstraZeneca have not been strong. They've not been good public health communicators. And this is creating a lot of concerns about uptake. And also, the United States has pulled out of the COVAX sharing facility as well as the World Health Organization. So it's very much adopted a go it alone strategy. And that also gives me a lot of concern. On the next slide, please. Next slide. So what we have now is this concept of uh, this terrible term called vaccinationalism. So now we talk about the Russian vaccine, the Chinese vaccine, the British vaccine, the American vaccine. We've never spoken that way about vaccines before. That's, that's brand new. Uh, and I think it's very destructive. So for, and so for instance, and, and it's also having uh, upsetting the global governance of vaccines. So for instance, now, when we talk to some of the leaders of the Latin American countries, one of the things that they say is, uh, look, uh, because the COVAX facility is for sharing vaccines has been unfinanced, we, we are worried that we'll only, we won't have vaccine for our entire population. So they're starting to do one-off negotiations with the Russians or the Chinese. And uh, this is uh, something unprecedented and, I, and something that I'm very worried about uh, moving forward. On the next slide, what I think is very important to do is think about how we're going to replace this with what we've always been doing for the last 60 years, which I call vaccine diplomacy, which is cooperation between nations to develop vaccines. And I think we have to get back uh, into that uh, mindset the concept of vaccine diplomacy uh, was very much pioneered by uh, Albert Sabin, who developed the uh, oral polio vaccine uh, at the, uh, uh, in, in the 1950s, the live oral polio strains, but it was actually developed in a vaccine with his uh, Soviet counterparts in the USSR when uh, Dr. Sabin uh, brought his strains. It was made into the vaccine and tested on 10 million Soviet school children. And ultimately, every uh, Soviet citizen under the age of 20 is leading to the licensure of the vaccine. And that's really what led to the, to the final development and release of the polio vaccine, two countries putting aside their ideologies to work together for purposes of vaccine development. And it happened again over smallpox vaccine quite Russians and Soviets had figured out how to freeze dry the uh, smallpox vaccine, making it possible for D.A. Henderson, then WHO, to lead an initiative with Bill Fagey and others to eradicate polio. Again, countries cooperating for purposes of vaccine development and delivery. And I'm very worried that we're losing that uh, and, uh, and I hope we can uh, right that ship at some point, particularly for the Americas, where I'm really worried that we won't have a uh, vaccine uh, sufficient for the population. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So, you know, what do we do about this situation where we're seeing, especially in the large urban megacities, we're already hearing, you know, in Guayaquil and Ecuador this year about bodies piling in the streets and 
some of the cities in Mexico getting hit very hard in Central America or in the northern Brazilian cities of Manaus and Fortaleza. But again, this virus is now racing through the southern hemisphere uh, going into uh, in, in Delhi or we're hearing terrible stories about Muscovaca in Bangladesh and or what will happen when this virus goes into Lagos in Kinshasa. I mean, how do you do social distancing when you're living under the conditions I'm showing you here? You can't. And the question is, how are we going to get vaccine to these populations? On the next slide. So uh, what's happened in Operation Warp Speed is that there are vaccine manufacturers who belong to what's called the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network, who are kind of figuring this out independently. And um, what we're seeing now is, for instance, uh, Sinovac uh, in China is coming with Institute of Butantan in Sao Paulo to uh, uh, develop, to uh, uh, produce the inactivated virus vaccine. Or uh, AstraZeneca Oxford is partnering with Fio Cruz and Biomanginos for the adenovirus based vaccine. Or in uh, Indonesia, Sinovac is collaborating with Biopharma for an activated virus vaccine. We know what the Russians are doing. In India, AstraZeneca Oxford is partnering with the Serum Institute of India. Bharat Biotech is producing an inactivated virus. And now we have launched a collaboration with Biological E to produce a recombinant protein-based vaccine in yeast, as well as J&J &J now has a BioE collaboration for adenovirus vaccine. And through these developing country va vaccine manufacturers, we think this is uh, an important opportunity in order to fill those gaps uh, that we're not necessarily uh, seeing through the, the big uh, pharma companies. Uh, otherwise, such as through Operation Warp Speed. On the next slide. So our, for our vaccine, our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, which is part of our School of Tropical Medicine, we've partnered with PATH. That has led the development of the malaria vaccine for Africa and the meningococcal A vaccine for Africa. Historically, they've done a lot of work with the Gates Foundation, and now they're working with us on our a recombinant uh, protein vaccine. Next slide, please. In our center, um, and that's uh, me with uh, Mary Elena Botazzi on the lower left there, who's been my science partner from the last 20, for the last 20 years. She's from Honduras, and we've been developing this, not only the science, but also this business model to develop parasitic disease vaccines, including a new uh, Chagas disease vaccine, Leishmaniasis vaccine, and then about uh, 10 years ago, on the lower right, we partnered with the New York Blood Center, Shibu Jiang and Lan Yin Du uh, uh, began working with us because they were very interested in coronavirus vaccines. And at the time, uh, there was no, 10 years ago, there was very little interest in coronavirus vaccines. Uh, and so we kind of adopted them as an orphan project just like we would do in neglected disease vaccines for parasitic diseases and began developing SARS and MERS vaccines. On the next slide. What they had found was if you look at the uh, coronavirus and the spike protein, which is this trimeric uh, protein, if you look at only the green component, which is the receptor binding domain, they had found that if you immunized with the receptor binding domain, you can get high levels of virus neutralizing antibodies without the problem of immune enhancement that you sometimes see with the full length uh, spike protein. And I'll try to show you a, a slide of that. So we adopted that approach for our coronavirus vaccines on the next slide. Uh, we began with the SARS-1 uh, receptor binding domain and we learned a lot enough to really rapidly accelerate the receptor binding domain for the SARS-2 uh, virus. And we began producing these in Pichia pastoris, which is a type of yeast. And you might say, well, why do I care about Pichia pastoris? Well, the interesting component, and there's a picture of those budding yeast, the faux color imaging, is that a yeast and a related one called Hinsenula has been used to develop, to produce recombinant hepatitis B vaccine in many different low and middle income countries, including Bangladesh, Brazil, Cuba, India, Indonesia. 
and they can do this for a dollar a dose, sometimes two dollars a dose, but very inexpensively. So we thought this would be a great technology for our COVID-19 vaccine. And now uh, we've uh, done that. We've signed a licensing agreement with Biological AE in India, and they're now scaling up to produce more than a billion doses of, of a vaccine, uh, com a large component for COVAX, but also uh, for non-COVAX activities as well. And what we think is there's an opportunity in how to accelerate this technology for Latin America. And we're looking to see how we can do technology transfer of this vaccine to places potentially such as Mexico or Panama, but we're quite open to uh, other countries as well because we're so concerned about this urgency of not having enough vaccine for the Latin American region. Next slide. And I won't go through, I guess because of time, I won't go through a lot of the data slides, but we're getting you know, high levels of virus neutralizing antibody. Next slide, please. We can go pretty quickly here. Next, this is the survival. Uh, I'll stop there for a second. Uh, one of the things I'd like to show you is the what immune enhancement actually looks like, because many people talk about it, but there are not many groups to actually show it. So, uh, and the spike protein, this is an, an a rodent model for the SARS-1 virus. You see those brown dots, those are eosinophilic infiltrates uh, that are shown by histochemistry. And this is what happens if we use the inactivated virus of the spike protein. But on the upper left, we can, we can get rid of that uh, just by, by removing the epitopes that are associated with it on the full length spike protein by showing it doesn't happen on the receptor binding domain. On the next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So now we're uh, accelerating this with biological E and, and, uh, and now going into clinical trials. And the hope is that if all of this is successful and we are seeing pretty good virus neutralizing antibodies, high levels in both rodents and non-human primates that we can, that this will translate to people as well. And then we can really look at how we can bring this to uh, Latin American countries. Uh, next slide. Um, I'll, I won't go too much longer uh, so I finish up because I know we, we started a bit late, but I'll just uh, finish uh, here by saying that um, I am very concerned about uh, the fact that even if we develop vaccines, that they may not be uh, scaled up and, and not only produced, but also delivered to the people who need them. Uh, what we're seeing through Operation Warp Speed is because there hasn't been that communication strategy, on the lower left, um, uh, there's been this misperception among the public in the U.S. that uh, vaccines are rushed, that they're not adequately tested for safety, that there's this conspiratorial relationship between the pharma companies uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the United States government. And there's a campaign afoot that in the United States called Health Freedom that says that because of that, um, we people should be free to choose whether or not they take their vaccines. And, and that is causing a huge amount of issues here in the United States. On the lower left, this is the number of kids who are not getting vaccinated in the state of Texas. We're up to now 70,000 kids whose parents are refusing to vaccinate them, especially in the Austin, Texas area. And this is even pre-COVID under the content, under the pretext of health freedom, which is really very much a fake concept uh, that is being uh, exploited. And now we have large surveys uh, on the right showing that up to half of Americans will refuse uh, COVID-19 vaccines, even if they're made available. And on top of that, even uh, because of all of the confusion and uh, around COVID-19, parents have also stop bringing their kids to the pediatrician. So we're seeing big declines in the U.S. in measles, mumps, rubella vaccine coverage, the MMR vaccine. It's coming back up a little bit, but it's still way down. So I'm very worried for the United States as I am all of the uh, Latin American region where we're starting uh, to uh, see now a fall rise in COVID-19 
uh, across the United States. And on top of that, we're now at risk of measles outbreaks or even influenza outbreaks because people aren't accepting influenza vaccines. And on the top left, we also, as Dr. Sparza mentioned, that um, I've been fighting this uh, anti-vaccine movement for years because they claim that vaccines cause autism and other chronic illnesses, and they don't. And I've written a, written extensively about that because I do have a daughter with autism. And just as though I, just as soon as I thought we were about to kind of win the day on that argument, all of the other stuff has happened. And so we're seeing now this very aggressive halting of enthusiasm for COVID-19 vaccinations because of um, uh, the anti-vaccine lobby. And now it's we're starting to see this globalizing as well. We're having anti-vaccine, anti-COVID vaccines and anti-mask protests in London and Berlin and Paris. Again, the U.S. seems to be ex exporting this health freedom movement. So I'm very concerned about that. And uh, maybe later we can have the opportunity to discuss this in more detail. So I'll stop there because of uh, some of the time delays and uh, to give the other speakers a chance. And uh, thank you again so much for having me today.